I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. Is AI the secret sauce we've been missing for a business revolution? Now, before you decide to move on and say, I've heard enough about AI, that's what we seem to be talking about all the time. Let's get this straight. This particular interview is really focused on some of the key tools that we all should be paying attention to in our businesses to help us become more productive and help us being able to advance our businesses. Not since Winslow Taylor back over 100 years ago, really started to revolutionize business after the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, have we seen this amount of change transform the business industry as we are right now? This is an unprecedented time. So it's important that we actually not only get on board with some of these changes, but we understand what some of the key ones are. That's what today's interview is all about. My interview is with a guy named Thomas Ryan, and Ryan is the CEO and founder of a company called Big Lee Sales, and he is a visionary leader reshaping the sales landscape through innovative AI solutions with a background in staffing and executive experience at WorkBeast LLC. Thomas identified the need for streamlined sales processes in the evolving market. His journey from the staffing industry to the forefront of AI-driven sales reflects his dedication to leveraging technology, evident in Bigly Sales cutting-edge tools for lead generation and customizable landing pages. Thomas's commitment to efficiency and client appreciation positions Bigly Sales as a trailblazer in the tech industry, showcasing his ongoing dedication to enhancing the sales experience through the power of artificial intelligence. So I really recommend you listen in on this conversation because the revolution is here. We need to be on board. Thomas Ryan on the business of intuition. Well, Tom, it's great to have you here from South Florida and uh, where it's much warmer than it is up here in Bend. Let's start right off. Um, we were talking before I hit the record button, just how quickly AI in general is not just uh, doubling every six months, but probably even faster than that. I, wanted, I want you to take us through the different parts of this. And from your perspective, you're learning, where are you seeing AI making an impact? So let's start off with at the beginning of a person's relationship with the company. I, I'm a, a company is going to try to find me, hire me. You know, the, so the whole hiring process. Maybe we could even go into onboarding. But what are you seeing specifically in the industry right now, of, in terms of how AI is, is improving or enhancing or speeding up the hiring process? So I haven't seen it much from this standpoint yet. Now I'm sure it's happening. I can tell you in every area of the organization, it's going to happen. So. They're used to do keyword search. I, I actually was grew up in the staffing industry, so this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, keyword search was very flawed, that you would try to find these keywords, and it wasn't very good at it, and it wasn't a great predictor having a keyword once on your resume of if someone was good at a job or not. And not even that, uh, a lot of good people who didn't change jobs very often didn't really know how to write their resume. The guys who were really good at writing resumes were the ones who had a professional resume writer do it for them. Um, Oftentimes, you know, a lot of the offshore uh, firms, those guys had the best resumes, right? Because a professional guy wrote that resume and they would even take the job description and write it directly to that job. But isn't isn't, (laughs) AI, in a sense, using keyword searches to be able to advance that the the time it takes to find the right uh, candidate or, or not? Is it? What do you, what I do you haven't see? seen. I mean, I haven't seen that application of it yet. Okay. Again, I'm sure they're going to use yeah. it to do a better job of finding resumes. Now, what it can do is it can review code very well, so it can take a look at someone's code. If we're talking about a technical role, mm. we're using it a ton for any piece of code that we're putting into our database. 
we're actually using something called, uh, I think it's Rabbit IQ, and yep. we review it with this piece of code before it goes in, and it's got ChatGPT on the back end. You know, it's a ChatGPT wrapper, and yep. it finds any conflicts, any problems, any errors that are in, in the code, and it's wonderful, and it does a better job than anyone on our QA team can do, and our head of QA um, was like, hey, we're going to use this going forward because we find conflicts that we just can't find otherwise. Yeah. So, I mean, it, from that standpoint, it, it's it's phenomenal for for that sort of thing, for reviewing code, for reviewing work, for finding errors in work, for rewriting work. I mean, there, there's so many different use cases, but I haven't specifically seen it go out and do recruiting, right. although it'd be very interesting to say, if I'm looking for a technical position, I want you to read everything this person has written technically, and I want you to grade exactly. it for me. I got it. And then you could summarize it, and you wouldn't have to go through it all. Well, or just tell you how, how good it is. Uh, yeah. How many errors do you find in here? Yeah, that's great. That's great. What about insecurity? I mean, today, I mean, what is it? Today is the 22nd of February of 2024. Uh, the news that I woke up to was that some of the major cell phone carriers had been hacked. And then, you know, there's 35,000 different incidences and you know major markets you know and we're hearing all the time that whether it's true or not but we're hearing it that you know a lot of these <laughs> other large uh countries out there china certainly and i'm sure we do it as well are constantly trying to hack each other's uh, networks and and so forth how could ai be useful in terms of security as a whole for a company i mean if someone is using ai to try to hack you you better have ai on the other side of it you know, it, it's as simple as that. It, if they're using these advanced tools to to try to hack, you need the advanced tools to protect against it. So with the security, there's a lot of things it can do. It can digest that data. It can look for patterns. You know, there there's a bunch of things you can do with, you know, there's a lot of things you can do really with machine learning in there, yeah. which I'm going to kind of use as synonymous with AI. At this point, to to look for patterns and and look for what's going on. So, like the security things that uh, we're dealing with, they look where's the IP. They they look do the time zones match? Do you know? There's probably for the security tools that we're using. There's two or three hundred different characteristics that they're looking at, and then they're trying to score all these things based on those characteristics. It's such a complicated model that. You can't really do it. I can't really do it as a human, right? There's yeah. just too many different factors, but the AI most, can do it. The AI you, can. You says that most companies, again, it depends upon what we mean by most and how big and so forth, but are using machine learning or AI to be able to protect themselves for security breaches. I are think. We, are we behind the eight ball here? While I don't think. I don't think we're behind the eight ball. I think these tools exist. Okay. Right. So I think there's a lot of tools that are out there for security that already exist. You can certainly use AI again to review your code and find vulnerabilities. Yeah. Right. So you can easily go take a cold base and, and say, hey, what are the vulnerabilities here? Now, the good part about that is you can find your vulnerabilities. The bad part about that is the bad guys, if they have their own AI, they can also find your vulnerabilities. Right. Right. right? So, you know, <laughs> if... Again, I think you have to be using these tools to to stay up to date with things and then to look at where breaches are coming from, to look at, you know, where bad actors are coming from. You can start putting together matrices on everything to see if someone's a bad actor. Like I can tell you, for people coming to our landing page, we're automatically blocking them based on certain criteria. You know, we're looking for uh, combinations that on a website. Yeah, on a website to say, hey, don't allow this person to fill out the form, right? Where they might be doing some sort of injection attack or whatever, right? Don't even show them the form if they're coming up a certain way. So it's um, almost like, you know, the companies that are large and they can afford to be able to stay on top of that, which is really a hard thing to do. I mean, I see stuff that are coming into my phone, you know, based on ads or whatever all the time, you know, like another app, another version of, of, chat gpt is coming out or what have you and i'm going like i'm taking notes i'm putting it down i'm throwing it in a file somewhere but how, how does a, a smaller company keep on top of all this stuff i mean could you even use ai to help you stay on top of it 
Yeah, you can is the short answer. So I think the best skill you can use is how to use AI right now. And how do you do that is you ask it a question and you have it give you the answer. So every question you just asked me, I guarantee you, ChatGPT or Claude or Grok or whichever service you're using will give you a better answer than I just did. It yeah. will be more articulate. It will be better thought out. It will, you know, especially with these technical issues that you literally ask the AI how to do something. So yeah. I'm not an engineer by trade. If I need to do something on the computer, the first thing I do now, it used to be like if I'm going to do something, I didn't know how to do it, I'd go to YouTube and I'd try to search around for the answer. Mm -hmm. Well, now you throw YouTube right out the window. You go to OpenAI, you go to Claude and you say, hey, how do you do this? And yeah. it will give you step-by-step -step instructions. And right. if there's right. something that you don't understand in one of those steps, you say, wait a minute, take, take a step back. How do I get to that screen or how do I find that thing? And it will give you detailed instructions of how to do that. And if you're dealing with code within it, you know, you can go, you could build an app in a day using OpenAI, right? Or Ghostwriter or one of these other tools. Just go in there and start asking it questions. I, I want to build an app to do this. Okay, how would I go about doing that? And then every time it kind of skips too far ahead and tells you information that you, is above your head, you go and say, wait a minute, take a step back. How do I do this Tell part? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yep. then you put the code in, you try to compile it, and if it fails, you say, hey, I got this error, and you, you know, copy and paste the error and everything you got in, and it says, oops, uh, there was a mistake in here, because sometimes it makes mistakes, but it will usually catch its own mistakes, mm -hmm. which is great. That I, I did it, we did a coding contest the other day, and we went and we took some rules that someone else had put out. We said, adapt these to our contest rather than us trying to write it from scratch. And it came up with it, you know, one minute later. Mm. And then we said, okay, how can we make these better? And it said, okay, how do we make it better? And it gave us suggestions for each one of them. And lo and behold, they were all better. <laughs> I yeah. mean, every single one of it. So like you say, you know, it's almost a joke where you say, okay, how do you do this? And then how do you do it better? And then, you know, it, it makes an even better version of it. Um, yeah, a, lot, a lot of people talk about, I mean, so you got ChatGPT and these different types of versions of it in that you just mentioned, which I'm thinking a lot of people are beginning to understand it. We use it quite a lot for a variety of different things. Are there other tools that you think are useful to use for somebody who's working in a company? For example, have you heard anything with, the, with respect to AI or machine learning that could help us manage our emails better? Because that's always one of those big issues that people say, I got 500 emails that come in a day. Is there something that you know of that will make people more productive or cut to the, to the things that they need to be looking at and disregard the others using AI as a tool to help us you know, manage this often big time suck? I know what exists. I don't know one off the top of my head. But I know there's people working on this. I think, you know, I've heard some names thrown around. I think Superhuman is doing something with it. And there's, mm -hmm. there's a couple other ones that are out there. I can tell you the tools that we use all the time. Yeah. What are right? For voice, Eleven Labs is amazing. You can clone any voice. You can do videos. You can make it sound like, you know, any person on earth. You can clone your own voice. You can make and what's it called? deeper. You can make Eleven Labs. 11 labs? Yeah. As in uh, the just, number 11? Like the number 11, like E, E L E. Okay. Right. Well, um, what, are your other, what are your other favorites? That's, that's, that's a good I mean, one. just that one's just amazing for things like I'm looking at the picture here on the camera. Yeah. Mid Journey will do a better job than the resolution I have looking at you actually on the screen right here. Uh, you can see every hair. You can see every dimple. You can oh, see every freckle. Okay. Thank I mean, you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no I can't see that over. I can't see that over Zoom, right? Oh, I, I got it. You know, <laughs> it's not as good over Zoom. Mid Journey. I mean, it's it's astounding how good these pictures look on there with the newest version. And again, you you looked at this a couple of years ago, and there was holes in them. And people had twelve fingers, and you know, yeah, like it. And now. It's just, I mean, it's astoundingly lifelike looking at these pictures. I mean, yeah, just astounding. Well, there are two um, Eleven Labs, Mid Journey. What's another favorite? 
I, I like Rose AI for pulling in data. I, I like that one for pulling in data. And then Claude and ChatGPT are great for information, although ChatGPT annoys the crap out of me. Um, Why is that? I, I use because it all the time. I keep asking it for things that it's real time data, and it's like, well, why don't you go to this website? And I'm like, why don't you go to the website, right? Like I'm asking <laughs> you, so I don't have to go to the website and look around for it. Yeah, you know, I, how about you do the work and give me the answer, buddy? You know, yeah. and so anyway, I get in little arguments with it from time to time. Where I, it, like, I think they're putting on the guardrails so it doesn't do too much work, right? They don't want people using too much compute. Where someone puts some big multi step task, like give me the revenues for every company in the Fortune 500 last year. It's like, well, you can find that at uh, S&P500.com. And I'm like, ah, can, can you just tell me the answer instead yeah, of yeah. sending me to another website? Right? If I wanted that, I would have Googled it. So it, I think they put on some guardrails on that. There's one called Grok that just came out where the speed is just insane. G-R-O-C-K? I believe it's G-R-O-Q? I, I believe so. Q. Okay. G-R-O-Q. Yeah. Dot com? Rock. Dot, I believe it's dot com. Might be dot AI or something, but it'll pop up. If you put Grok AI, okay. it'll pop okay. up. And what is with this? Well, it's like ChatGPT, except you're getting answers in a fraction of a second where well, it's you. It's not like ChatGPT is taking a long time. I mean, I mean, let's, you know, maybe it's taking 15 seconds. Is it, is it worth the, the speed or is it better answer? It depends on the use case, right? Okay. Okay. So if I'm trying to do real-time voice, which is something that we're working on right now, does it matter if it takes a 10-second lag? You bet it does, mm-hmm. right? So we're one of the big things that we're working on is we're aiming to replace the call center. That the, the human call center, um, I want to replace it with AI and have every call rep have perfect information, answer the phone instantly, yeah. never have any hold time again be able to handle any problem real time. So all the level one support and all the, you know, kind of issues that go along with that, that now if a company doesn't do it, you just know they're being cheap (laughs) because they should be able to do it for a few pennies a query. Uh, Will people be able to realize that they're talking to a non-human? They might realize they're talking to a non-human. Where I see it going is that it's going to be hyper-persuasive. It, is going to not be as good as a human. It's going to be many times better than the average human. Mm -hmm. Just like if they asked you to draw a picture, right? Is your picture going to look as good as what OpenAI is going to come up with, with Dolly or or with uh, Midjourney or one of those? I I don't think you have a chance, right? Maybe maybe you're a great artist and I'm insulting you. No, I'm not. I, I, I mean, I have no chance of being able to draw something as well as one of those softwares. Uh, if I worked on it for a month straight, 10 hours a day, I wouldn't have something looking half as good as that comes up with within 10 or 15 seconds. So I see the same thing happening for this, that the call center, the reps, as they get millions and billions of reps under their belt, and as it's been trained on all those messages, it's going to be hyper persuasive. It's going to know exactly how to respond in every situation. It's going to know what your personality type is. It's going to know what you respond to based right. on your personality type, based on you know information about you, probably based on things you've read or written, yeah. right? That it can access your Facebook account and your Twitter account and your Instagram account, and it'll know what you have written and what you have uh, posted and your comments, and it will know exactly how to handle you. And again, it being the, the proverbial AI, you're not... It being the proverbial AI. AI. Yeah. I mean, that's what I see over time, that all this data is out there to be collected and analyzed. And the speed that things are advancing right now, I, I used to say, oh, if it advances, if it doubles every six months, you know, we're going to be a million times more powerful in 10 years. From what I'm seeing, it's doubling every couple of months, every month yeah. or two. Yeah. I was telling you this before, uh, you know... A year and a half ago, you had 4,000 characters in chat GPT that it would have in its working memory. Mm. Well, the new Gemini is coming out with 10 million. I mean, that's 2,500 times more powerful in a year and a half, two years. Mm. You know, it's insane how much it has advanced. uh, And they barely have the computer chips to do it right now. They're, They're, 
you know, NVIDIA, you saw their earnings, uh, their own back order for those chips is as many as they can make. Yeah, right. I mean, and it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. Well, let me let me add, let me pivot here for a second, Tom. Yeah, I you know, I geek out on this quite a bit. I, there's, I for me, it's it's about productivity. It's about getting more done and maybe getting it done better. I, I get that. There's also sort of this ethical thing that keeps coming into my head, and I. I think that it does for other people. It creates fear sometimes. Like, I'm going to be obsolete uh, at some point. You know, maybe I'm a call center person, you know, and you just mentioned how this could be automated. So there's there's a big part of our economy that might be gone. I have people who are fine artists in my family. We have our house full of original acrylic oil paintings. But, of course, at some point, maybe you've these particular programs like uh, Mid Journey could do as good a job or better than a human being to create something that uh, would be indetectable as to whether or not it was done by a human or a human being. And so maybe we start to shift our value towards the created AI production versus the human production of things. And I just, I, I, I just, I don't even know what the the question is. It just seems like. The technology is happening so fast. It is. There's a piece, there's a piece of me and others that I think go. Is anybody minding the store? Meaning the story is what it means to be human. Is anybody saying yes? We can, but the long term effects of this are we're going to change something that we hold dear to what it means to be human. What is your reaction? <laughs> I see where you're coming from, and I understand where you're coming from. But to me, this is like someone saying, you know, I used to be a fast runner, and I could run about 20 miles an hour, and now they have airplanes, and an airplane can move much faster. Great. You know, am I less human because there's an airplane now? I, I've heard um, that same argument. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean... I used to be able to do something, and now a computer can can do it better. I used to calculate math in my head, and I used to like to solve problems, but a computer can solve it to the thousandth decimal point in a second. Yeah. Am I less of a human being, right? So yeah. to say that there is now a piece of technology that does things better than you as a human, it, it's just there's slightly different technologies here. So I... Is it going to replace fine art? Is it going to replace someone painting a, a picture? Probably not. But is it going to replace someone doing graphic design on a computer? Probably so. You bet it is. Yeah. Right? Sure. So yeah. it's going to be better at graphic design on a computer, but it doesn't mean that art goes away or that prose goes away. One of the things that I've seen with AI, and maybe this is going to change, but it's autocomplete. It fills in the gaps. It, yeah, yeah. It the way it works is it's been trained on everything ever written, everything ever spoken, and it guesses what character comes next. It guesses what you know, which uh, which block comes next, right? So the each word would typically be a block, yeah, and or a token or whatever you want to call it, and that's the way it works. And it's read everything Shakespeare's ever done, and the other ten million people have copied Shakespeare, right? Yeah. And the people that Shakespeare copied, the Greeks that he copied, yeah, and right. it, you know, and it has gone and taken that, and then it puts it together in a way that looks kind of like it. And if you say copy this person's style or copy their style, but it doesn't think and it doesn't really create from that standpoint. It just copies what other people have done. I think, I think what's happening over time, and it's a slow drip, but maybe it's dripping faster now because technology is happening so Quickly, is that we're slowly def changing the definition subconsciously of what it means to be human. That that a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, what it meant to be human <laughs> was that you tilled your own land and you you you, you, know, you work with horses and you you built your own property, you know, your own your own houses. Um, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And now we we, we kind of changed their definitions and the. The definition of what it means to be human is is maybe becoming different. It's sort of like maybe it's shrinking, or maybe it's becoming more collaborative, more creative. Maybe it's actually creating a 
a burst of spiritual awareness because we're no longer sort of distracted by just the survivability because we don't have to take down trees to be able to build houses, you know? And, and, I, and I wonder also, also is, is are we beginning to redefine human, hum, humanness or humanity from a technological perspective? Like the definitions are now morphing to say, those were words we used to use just to define technology. Now those words are being used to define human beings. We're becoming more symbiotic with technology. I mean, you can make the argument for today that, you know, I can't find a person who doesn't have a phone attached to them, right? That's staring down at that screen. They just implanted a chip in people's brains. I heard Zuckerberg joke, and you you might want to wait for version three or four, you know. Uh, you know, you don't want to have to remove that and get the latest version. He's working on a he's right, working right. on a device that goes on your wrist, where right. you're going to be able to use that device to control things using your mind. That right. you're going to be able to control the mouse. You're going to be able to control the computer using or your mind. Neuralink, to... I think. Neuralink yeah. from uh, that from, from Musk. Okay. Okay. Musk was talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Musk. Had, they just did the first successful test in a human. Uh, Zuckerberg has having something similar that goes on your wrist, except it's not inside your body. It's just a electronic device. But right. between that and the AI, people are becoming more and more connected to technology in such a way that it, it's almost becoming a part of them. Right. That it's going to feel like you have superhuman powers in five or ten years that you can think about something and make it happen on a computer screen. You can think about something and manipulate something in the electronic world which or is if you see something then you would no longer need to take pictures anymore because what you're seeing actually becomes recorded and stored on the net somewhere you, know, so you might even think take a picture of this and boom yeah it's or there your eyes twice and now you just take a picture of something yeah uh, yeah that's yeah. i mean it's, so we're, we're becoming more connected to technology there's no question i like what you said before about jobs Right. What does it mean to be human? Does toiling on the field mean you're human? Right. Um, if you went back 200 years, you take a look at it. 90% of the workforce worked on the farm. And if you told right. them, hey, machines are going to come and they're going to do this job for you, everyone said, oh, my God, what are we going to do? We're all going to be unemployed. Exactly. No one's going to have any work to do. Exactly. Right. And if you went back and you said the same thing about factories, hey, we're going to have robotics, you know, do most of the things at a factory. And I said, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And, you know, no one's going to have a job anymore. Well, right, so, computers, they thought they were going to do a four-day work week, and then we'd have all this free time. It didn't actually happen. <laughs> we now are working yeah, I, more than we ever have before. I, I sure am. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know about everyone else, but I, I am. am. As well. Anyway. Your, your um, point's taken. Your point's really taken. I, and I, I think it's an evolutionary conversation, as much as technology is evolving as well. It's just um, happening so fast. It's just yeah. happening so fast. It, and I, another... <laughs> I think that's why conversations like this, if I could, Tom, and uh, others are so important, is that people really need to at least realize it's here, it's happening fast, and oh you need God. to spend some time staying current with it. Because without it, if you are listening to this conversation and you haven't even played around with ChatGPT, you're behind the curve right now, and you need to catch up. I was just with a group of people over in Chicago about five weeks ago. Maybe four out of 12 even knew what ChatGPT was. I went, my gosh, you guys. You're a dinosaur. Like, You're a dinosaur, dude. You got to catch up. And this will help your productivity, which is one of their big issues. So anyway, I, it, it is something that we all need to be very vigilant to be able to at least say, I, at least I understand it. I will never be able to get it all, but I need to know some of the basics. Um, I don't have to be an early adopter, but <laughs> it's, it's here. Yeah. And this is about the difficulty of using Google for everyone who doesn't know, right? This is about as hard as using Google. You yeah. punch something in and it spits out an answer. Right. It's just more useful than Google because it can actually tell you how to do things in detail. It's not just sending you to a web page. It has yeah. looked at every piece of technical documentation ever written and gives you the best response. And if it's wrong... It says, oops, let me try again. Let me take a look. Like, hey, I think I found where things went off course. And then it corrects it for you, which I just think is astounding. I read a book as a kid. I back to your other point. Yeah. Uh, it was called A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. And it was by Mark Twain. And it was kind of a fantasy thing where uh, this 
Connecticut Yankee went back in time. And what struck me about the book was all these things that he had known how to do 150 years ago. I couldn't do any of them. My father couldn't do any of them, right? No one in my family could do any of them. They didn't know how to do any of these. So these things that were essential to their survival that, you know, a person was doing 150 years ago, we had lost them all from our work and knowledge. Right. You know, yeah. but there were things they didn't know a thousand years ago, or at least, right. you know, that was kind of the premise of the book. Right, right. Um, well, you know. so, so, Tom, one last question. What's your favorite AI tool that you want to really understand? What What's the the thing you're reaching for? Then, like, God, I want to, I, this, this is the one that really gets me up in the morning to be I able want to learn. That. I want the one with the 10 million characters. I mean, yeah. <laughs> My God, you know, it went from being able to put in, okay, you can put in three or four pages uh, of stuff, you know, maybe, maybe 10 pages to, I mean, 20,000. What's the name of that again? Is that That's the new Google one that's coming out, Gemini, Gemini okay. 1.5. So they're releasing the million character version. They're working on a 10 million character version, which is so far bigger than, or 10 million uh, tokens, I should say. It's so far bigger than. Let me ask you this: what is with, all the, today? with all the computing and the computation that's going on, do we have enough warehouses, servers, energy to support all this? Energy is an interesting question. Do we have enough chips right now? No. Yeah. I mean, there, there is. We. This is going to use up every chip we can make, for as far as the eye can see. Mm. Right. And they can't just use basic chips. You can't just use a base semiconductor. It has to be these super high end chips with all these tensors and all this compute power. Um, so they're working on new chips. They're working on chips that are 10 times as fast, 100 times as fast. Those, let's see how successful they are with them. But, you know, those should be coming out in the next few years here. AI specific chips that work. 10, 100 times faster than the current things that are out there. So, uh, but but no, we can't do that. Now, as far as the com the com the energy involved, I think that's really a, a totally different conversation. Right. Right. It's, um, do we have enough energy? Probably. We just have to get a little better at harnessing it. Maybe right. nuclear. You know, you've, you've been hearing about these small nuclear reactors that they could do, the thorium reactors or the the reactors that are just enclosed in a, basically a, a steel cube that you can mm -hmm. it's the micro reactors that you can bury that are done so mm -hmm. i know they're talking about using that for a lot of data centers that you can just take one of these nuclear reactors have it be in a 10 by 10 cube and when it's done you bury it in the ground and it, it's just one solid piece it can't leak it's not going to be spilling radiation everywhere huh. you know there, there's no fukushima or thorium, you know, these kind of th some of these lower yield things instead of what is typically being used. Um, I think it's maybe I, maybe I have the wrong thing off the top of my head here, but um, yeah, there there is a bunch of things that they're looking at with nuclear specifically for powering these in a way that yeah, you know, I, I used to be scared of nuclear too, like oh my god, yeah, we're, right, we're gonna have another Fukushima type event. Well, in my childhood, it was Three Mile Island, so that's dating me, but I remember that when I was a kid, that was a big deal. That's the wing yeah. sauce now, the Three Mile Island, if you go and get it. Exactly. So, Tom, this has been fascinating, and I've, I've taken some notes. That hopefully, other people have as well. Uh, again, the point's so well taken that we got to stay up on this, and, and this, is, this is here. The future is here. We need to continue to learn about it. How can people follow what you're doing and uh, connect with you if they so desire? Yeah, go find us on biglysales.com, and we have AI for landing pages to build out landing pages, and those are hooked to autoresponders that automate scheduling for sales. And if you don't contact someone within the first hour of them filling out a form, and you're in most industries, you might as well take that lead and throw it in the trash, because yeah. they've already called someone else, and they've already found someone else to do the job. So. We right. auto-respond immediately. We schedule appointments automatically. We send reminders so no one forgets. Sure. And uh, we're integrating voice with the email and SMS technologies, uh, you know, coming here in the next uh, month or two. Great. Well, Tom, thank you very so much for your, your ideas and your energy. It's been great to talk to you. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Dean. You bet. 
Thank you for listening to The Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.